you do, would you help me welcome Pastor Sean as I tell you about the last, yeah, you, you'll share with him about that one. Excited. Well, hey, family, we're so glad that you're with us tonight. Do me a favor, open up your Bibles, turn them on. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 tonight, and uh, we're going to be talking about the idol of control, and uh, we're going to talk about it from the perspective of the prodigal son, um, but we're going to look at it from a little bit of a different perspective than maybe you're used to when you've heard or read this story before. So Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24, and will you open up your Bible and you get there, some of you may be wondering, what in the world is an idol of the heart? What in the world is an idol of the heart. And here's what I wanna tell you. An idol of the heart is anything that your heart runs to before it runs to Jesus. An idol of the heart is anything that you make like God in your heart. And you can usually find an idol of the heart by way of how you respond when things don't go the way that you want them to go. So tonight we're gonna talk about control, right? Because nobody in here right, is a control freak. Can I get an amen? Uh, some wife just elbowed somebody in the room. Uh, nobody in here is a control freak. I mean, all of you absolutely love when things don't go the way that you want them to go, right? You love when you get on the 405 freeway and they shut it down to one lane. You, you love when you're on the 5 freeway driving back from Seattle and there's an accident that closes down the entire freeway for almost two hours. Oh wait, that wasn't you, that was me, right? None of us in here ever have any issues when things don't go our way. You might struggle to say amen to that tonight. The reality is this, that we might call certain people control freaks, but in the culture that we live in, we have become absolutely obsessed with the idea of controlling things. So let's talk a little bit about what the idol of control is. Tonight, I wanna remind you with this big idea that the idol of control is longing to have everything go according to your plan. Not God's plan, but your plan. So what is the idol of control? The, the idol of control is defined as an over-desire for the mastery of self through factors like, let's say, hard work or productivity or performance or even perfectionism. People who struggle with the control idol, they strive for self-sufficiency. They long to secure a sense of certainty in their life, primarily by burdening themselves with more and more responsibility and ensuring that everything in their environment is to their liking and in their order. When the desire for control goes deeper, it begins to demand in us a compulsive-like behavior. It becomes a ruling desire of the way that we think, the way that we live, the way that we act. It becomes the idol at the center of our life. And let me tell you that idols always affect how you feel and how you live. So let's talk about it tonight in Luke chapter 15. Walk with me in verse 11 as we think through the story of the prodigal son from a perspective that might be different for you. Tonight it says this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after, the young son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country. There he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food for spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he, go, he goes to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with what? Compassion for him. He ran to his son, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and the son said to the father, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put on a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have some carne asada tonight. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is what? Found. So they began to celebrate. But guess who wasn't celebrating? Normally, we look at this story from the perspective of the younger brother, but tonight, as we look at the idol of control, what I want to do is I want to flip the script and begin to look at this scripture from the perspective of the older brother. Let's jump down to verse 25. It says this, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. It must have been bachata or cumbia. I don't know what was going on over there. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he is safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I never disobeyed your orders. Yet You never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my homies. But when his son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was what? Lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would teach and guide us tonight by the truth of your word that we would understand, oh God, that we often have the heart posture of an older brother. God, that we often wonder why you're not doing for us what you're doing for others. God, that we often wonder why others can squander and we're left serving you faithfully. God, let us not grow bitter. Let us not grow confused. Let us see tonight that the idol of the control of our lives, our hearts, our souls, and our minds eats us from the inside out. God, help us to give control over to you because you are the only one that is actually in control. We love you, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said. So the older brother, he gets indignant. He sees himself better than his brother because he's doing what he's supposed to do. Any older brothers or sisters in the room, do me a favor, just raise your hand right where you are. Mm, I feel the anointing already. <laughs> older brothers and sisters, you've been through it. All your siblings have wore your clothes and you kept them nice so they could wear them. All of your siblings have learned from your mistakes and all of your siblings get a nicer version of your mother and your father because they took it out on you. Can I get an amen tonight? As the oldest sibling, I know exactly what he was going through. But he felt unrecognized. He feels unappreciated for all his hard work. In fact, he's coming in from the field and he hears that there's a party going on and he's like, why is there a party going on? I'm out here working. No one invited me. No one looked for me to tell me that the brother's back. They're out killing the calf and throwing a celebration. And here I am doing exactly what God asked me to do and what my dad asked me to do. And here's what happens. His indignant anger becomes his identity. Listen to the way he answers his father. Many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed you, and yet you didn't even give me a goat for me and my friends to have a party? I mean, I don't know who's out here eating goat, but you need to pray for that brother. He was so mad he was ready to eat a goat, Jesus. Oh, man, I, I, I'll take the chicken, I'll take the pig, and I'll take the cow before I take the goat. But see, here's what happens. The older brother internalizes a view of self that he is unimportant and unappreciated because of the feelings and experiences that he has seen with his younger brother. He, he begins to build for himself a cycle of control. 
He begins to build for himself a wheel that he will get trapped in and he will run through over and over and over again. Now his responsibilities will become a burden. Now he will be disregarded no matter what he does. Now it doesn't matter who appreciates him. He will never, ever, ever feel appreciated. So what does he do? He decides to take control of the situation and tell everyone what they have have done wrong to him and we do the same when our core hurts begin to eat at us we put ourselves in the cycle of control we believe that life is out of control so we take control out of God's hands and we put it in our hands so here's what I've done because I'm an image person I love images I created a cycle for you to begin to understand what was happening in this situation so here's this older brother, and, and his past experience is this, that, that his father gives grace to an irresponsible younger brother. Anybody ever been mad because you were responsible and the other person wasn't, but God blessed them in a way that you didn't get blessed? But then the brother not only gets blessed, he takes off and leaves the family. You ever felt like you were stuck with responsibilities because somebody else didn't follow through with what they were supposed to do? And then, not only does that happen, but now the father grants this unreasonable demand. He's like, look, you want half, you can have it. Go live however you want. And he's like, wait, why does he get half? He hasn't earned any of it. You ever seen God give somebody something and they squander it? And you wonder why God gave it to them in the first place? So so what begins to happen is instead of looking at the reality that God is using this to shape his younger brother, he identifies by the past experience. Now his experience becomes his identity. Now his internal view of who he is is, I am unimportant. I am unrecognized. I am unappreciated. And now no matter what people do to appreciate him or recognize him or show that he is valued, no matter how God speaks to him, he has created a false identity of who he is. So how do we get to the current situation? Well, the younger brother shows back up. I mean, this dude has squandered everything he has and he walks back in the house like nothing ever happened. I know none of you have ever asked God to punish people for the stupid things that they've done. You're better than the disciples, right? Because when the disciples walked into a town, they're like, Jesus, they didn't receive you. Bring down lightning, kill everybody. Go ahead, do it, Jesus. Just go ahead, kill every single person here. But we don't think like that because we're better than they are, right? No, the younger brother returns without warning. And how does the father respond? He doesn't give him the chancla. He doesn't whoop his behind. He doesn't call him out. He hugs him on the road. Wait, 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 hold on. God, God, you're gonna give this man what he doesn't deserve? Yes, just like you got what you didn't deserve. But then the hurt begins to take over, doesn't it? Because now we're comparing ourselves to other people. Now I'm taken for granted. Now I'm betrayed. Now my work is overburdened. Even the work you ask God for, you will now begin to grumble and complain against God for the very thing you prayed for. You'll get married and then pray that God would change your spouse and you were praying that your spouse would marry you. You will pray that God would open up your womb and give you a child, and then as soon as the child doesn't do what you want them to do, now they're a burden to you. You'll pray for good friendships, but as soon as somebody's gotta call you out because you weren't living the way God wanted you to live, oh, now they just bad bad friends and they don't know how to be a good friend like me. See, our hurts begin to define how we live based on bad emotions. What happens? You become angry, confused, and indignant, and then it works its way out to your hands and your feet. Now you gotta show everybody how good you really are. Now you gotta make yourself seem better than other people. Now you gotta compare what other people have and you don't have. Now you grumble and you complain and what else happens? You refuse to participate in the goodness of God. Family, when you accept the idol of control at the center of your life, You refuse to participate in the goodness of God. You know what the father was telling him? Son, 
I don't know why you're upset about the party because everything in the party already belongs to you. You're my faithful son. You won't join the party because somebody else is getting celebrated, because somebody else is getting highlighted, because you're not getting what you want and what you think you deserve. God, show us how we can break the cycle of control. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna, I wanna help you through a couple of main things that I think you could do that could begin to crush the idol of control. If you're struggling with this and you find yourself in this cycle wondering, God, how am I ever gonna get out of this? What I wanna do tonight is I wanna give you a few things that I think will help you understand that control is meant to be crushed so that you could give it back to the one that had it in the first place. The first one is this, that, that if you wanna crush the cycle of control, you got a desire to be with God, not be like God. If you wanna crush the idol and the cycle of control, you got a desire to be with God, not like God. See, here's what begins to happen. You begin to forget that God is in control and you let the devil take control. This is Genesis three, the creation story. God is in control of all things. They have access to everything. Think about this, they're just like the older brother. All that God has created belongs to Adam and Eve and then comes the serpent slithering in. And the one thing God said, please do not do this. It will separate you from me. It will surely be your death. He says, come on, did God really say that? Why don't you take what you really deserve? And the devil takes control of their life and sin begins to enter the world. But you see a reversal of this in John chapter 15. What you find is Jesus saying, abide in me and I in you and what? You will bear much fruit. What he's saying is this, that when you give control back to God, you begin to understand that life is not about control. Life is about serving the one that's in control. Too many of us think that life is about getting what we want. Too many of us think that life is about controlling our perception with other people. Let me encourage you, people could lie about you, people could steal against you, people could cheat on you, and let me tell you, God can still be in control because they don't own you, God does. He created you and sustains you. And he's in control of all things. What begins to happen when you pick up the idol of control is you begin to say this, God, I know better than you. And I don't want you to do what you want to do. I want you to do what I want you to do. And you begin to demean the goodness and the mercy and the grace of the living God. Let me remind you that Jesus chose time with the Father over the praise of other people. And if you live for the praise of people, if you live for what people say about what you do, if you work so that you could be loved or, or clapped for or for the paycheck, there will be a time where it runs short and you will find yourself in a cycle where it is never enough. But I love Jesus because in Luke 4, to prepare for a major task, Jesus spend some time, 40 days in the wilderness. Think about this. God is about to do miracles and he goes and hides for 40 days to make sure that there's nothing in him that is out of control. To recharge after hard work in Mark chapter six, Jesus sends the 12 out to do ministry and he goes off and he rests with God. Don't tell me that you cannot Sabbath, take breaks with God and not take your vacations and just keep grinding and that you're gonna be good and never try to pick up control. Let me tell you, grind culture is from the devil. You don't need to grind, you need to submit. You don't need to work harder, you need to submit to the goodness of God. You need to abide in him and he in you. And let me tell you, the more you submit, the more God will do. The more you submit, the more God will show you. You know, it's crazy because the more time you spend with God, somehow, I don't know how he does it, it's a kairos kind of thing. God shows up and God gives you more time than you had when you were just grinding it out without him. Things begin to consume us and we miss God in the moment. And I wanna encourage you, Jesus, over and over and over again, choose his time with God before he does anything. So how are you doing? 
How are you doing with abiding in Christ? How's your Bible reading? How's your fasting? What's your worship time like? And I'm not talking about Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings. I'm talking about when it gets hard, when stuff hits the fan, are you worshiping God? Are you glorifying him? Are you thanking him for his goodness in your life? Why? Because the Bible says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Are you lamenting and allowing God to turn what was burdened into praise? Are you allowing God to show you that he is in control and he has a plan even when it looks like there is no way? I mean, because I know a young man who got fired from his bank job and now God is sending him all over the United States and is gonna eventually send him around the world and he's living out his dream. Why? Because God had a plan when it seemed like there was no way. I, I know a young man who, who grew up in a cult and could never see himself as a pastor because the way that his father and his grandfather abused religion. But let me tell you, in Santa Barbara, in one of the wildest, most liberal, non-Christian towns at a college where they don't talk about Jesus, Joel found Jesus, God began to use him, and now he's pastoring a church and rebuilding the legacy where there was no way. I saw a young man in Taylor come to our church and Taylor, I'm just gonna put it out there. You came high as a kite, my dude. I was like, I could smell this man from a mile away. He came to church broken and defeated, thinking there was no way, but God met him in that moment. He gave up control and God showed him, no, I have a way for you. Man, I could go on and on and on. I could tell you about Isai's story. I could tell you Daz's story. I could tell you story after story after story. But listen to me. The more you give up control to God, the more in control of your life God really is. The second thing you need to recognize is that people are souls to be loved, not obstacles to be moved. Souls to be loved, not obstacles to be moved. Jesus never treated people like pawns or roadblocks. And the more you step into the idol of control, the more you will use and abuse people for what you think God wants you to do and wants them to do. You're not God, he's their God. You're not God, he's your God. And Jesus in Matthew 9 sees them harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Listen to me. You need to be shepherded by God. And you need to let others be shepherded by God. If people are coming to you to get fed by God, you're not feeding people. You understand what I'm saying? Too many people live their life with Jesus vicariously through somebody else. Now, let me tell you, I hope that when you come here, you learn and you grow. And when we preach, you are taught and you take that and you learn throughout the week. But if that's all you get throughout the week, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You have a relationship with Sean. I'm not God and I'm not eternal and I don't know all things and I can't fix your life, but I know the one that's in control of your life. And my job is not to make you eat or drink. My job is to show you the one who will lead you to still waters. My job is to show you the one who will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. My job is to show you Jesus. Your job is to serve him. The third is this, seek after presence, not approval. Seek after presence, not approval. Too, too many people, I, I just, I, I see this all the time. Too many people seek after the approval of other people as what satisfies their soul. Can I, can I just speak to you for a second? Um, you are approved even when people don't approve of you. You are approved even when your boss doesn't like what you do. You are approved even when somebody's tried to label you something that you're not. You are approved even if that person says that you are not enough for them. God says, I love you and I'm for you and I've approved you and I've adopted you and you are 
mine. Family, do not live for the approval of a world that cannot save you. Do not live for the approval of people that cannot truly satisfy your soul. I want to encourage you in your heart and in your soul, there is a missing piece that only Jesus can fill and satisfy. It's not a significant other. It is not a best friend. It is not the perfect job. It is not the car that you drive. It is not the clothes that you wear. It is not followers on Instagram or TikTok. Let me tell you, it is only God that can satisfy. See, Jesus tells this parable to rebuke people who sought righteousness through obedience as an example of a way to control other people. They were so deep in this cycle that they believed that they were better than everyone else because of what they knew about God that they couldn't even see God looking them in the face. Think about this. The same people that claim to know God the best are the people that shouted for Jesus to be crucified. And in the same way, family, your language about God, your understanding of the word with a hardened heart against God, a heart that does not belong to him, but that you hold on to and allow to be hardened, it will separate you and keep you from seeing God when he's working right in front of you. It will keep you out in the field when God is throwing a party. Let me encourage you. There is no such thing as self-redemption. It doesn't exist. It's not possible. You cannot redeem yourself from the things that you've done nor the things that have been done to you, but praise God there is one that has redeemed the world. Can I get an amen tonight? Praise God that God himself said they can't redeem themselves, so I will redeem them. God is like the one who is in a courtroom as a judge and sees all the times you acted like the older brother, all the times you secretly hated somebody in, their, in your heart because of what they got and you didn't. God is like that judge that looks at you and goes, yeah, all those things that you pretended to be that you aren't, all those things that you did in my name but really didn't believe, you are guilty of those things and I must judge you for them. But he is also the judge that takes off his robe and pays the price for you. There is no self-redemption. Family, listen to me tonight. You are only redeemed by the work of the cross and the love of Jesus. Stop chasing redemption and run to the one that can redeem you. He is the one that can release you from the cycles of control, the idols of control. And you might be wondering tonight, Pastor Sean, where do I even begin to start with this? I say you start with this. You're God, I'm not. And then you begin to look at your life and say, okay, because he's God and I'm not, here are the things that I really, really want to happen. I mean, deep in my heart, God, like they're my dreams. I don't, I don't even know if I could live without them. And here's what I would encourage you to do tonight, tomorrow, this week. I would encourage you to make a list, write them down. I don't care if you do it in a journal or a diary or on your phone or wherever it is. I want you to make a list and I want you to begin to think of the things that you think you cannot live without, the things that you think you need to be satisfied. And then what I want you to do is I want you to get on your knees and I want you to look at that list and I want you to submit that list to God and say, God, none of these things matter matter more than you. No idol of wood or metal or flesh that I could build could ever satisfy my soul. But Jesus Christ, you are the only thing that will ever satisfy me. So family, I want to encourage you tonight. Crush the cycle of control. Recognize that the more you give your life to God, the more God will do in your life. 
Let me say it again so that you hear me tonight. The more you give your life to God, the more God will do in your life. I pray that we not be the generation that was like the Israelites wandering around in the desert for 40 years because we're not getting what we want. And God is saying, I already gave you what you needed. You need freedom. Family, you don't need the food that you think you want. You don't need the things that you used to have when you were in your sin. You don't need any of those things. You need freedom. And freedom is only found in Jesus. Freedom from the flesh, freedom from sin, freedom from believing that other people or you control your life. Family, God is in control even when the world seems out of control. You know, I talk to people all the time and they're like, Pastor Sean, how could you be so chill when the world is like wilding out? Things are getting crazy in the Middle East. You know, I mean, man, that guy was preaching and, and somebody ran up on him and tried to stab him on stage. Aren't, aren't you afraid, Pastor? Listen to me. God is in control. And listen, if God allows it, he has a plan for it. He has a purpose for it. And sometimes we block the purpose of God by trying to make things go the way we want them to go. You know how many people are hearing about Jesus right now because somebody tried to stab a pastor on a stage? And you know what I love? His only defense was the cross of Jesus. He didn't fight back. Man, I would have busted a karate kid on that dude. Let me tell you right now. Come up in this church and try to do something to me and I will get you. I love you. I will get you, but I will lay you out and I will pray for you afterwards and I will ask God to resurrect you. I promise you, you can try if you want, but Taylor's going to get you before you get to the stage. I promise you right now. But you know what I love about this man's defense? His only defense is first reaction. This is how you can tell that somebody's given up the idol of control. He didn't fight. He didn't kick. He held out the cross. And you know what happened? That knife jammed because God is good. Because God said, no, 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 no. You have a plan, but that's not my plan, and I'm not going to let that happen. Listen to me, family. If God is allowing something, it's for a purpose. And man, sometimes those things are hard. And I want to wrestle with you to figure out, like, how could God be allowing something like this to happen? Some of you in here, I get it. You feel like Job. I mean, you're not Job. You think you are. But, like, you ain't lost your wife, your kids, your house, your cattle, everything, you know? sickness to your body your friends left you like anybody that's trying to be like I'm Job I'm like mm, just because your car radiator broke down don't mean you're Job chill I'm not talking about you Alberto I'm just saying you know Job lost everything but he always knew that God was in control fight with God plead with God bring your doubts to the factory of faith recognize that God doesn't want you to follow him blindly but trust and believe that as long as you are in control, things will feel out of control. Family, I want to encourage you to give up the idol of control. There are things in our life that we try to control. We try to control the way people behave. We try to control the way other people perceive us. We, we try to control outcomes and situations. We, we try to manipulate things to get what we want. We will try to control and control and control thinking, my God, God, if I just got what I want, I'll be happy. And then you'll get it and it will ruin you. And so tonight, here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray for you. I wanna remind you of this challenge. There is no thing that is self-redemption. There is only redemption through the cross. There, there's, there's no self-satisfaction. Only Jesus can satisfy. Stop chasing things. Run to Jesus, for he is your way of escape. So tonight, would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. And I'm going to do something a little bit different. I feel led by the Spirit just to do something different, and I can do this if I want to. So uh, Pastor Joel, Daniel, Taylor, do me a favor. You guys just stand up in the front right here. Face the audience. Isaiah will come up in just a moment. Um, Jensen, do me a favor. Come down here, bro. Jensen, you come down here. Um, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you a moment to respond to this message. 
I want to give you some time as we just take some time to worship. We don't, we don't need words to worship. Sometimes we just need to speak from our own heart and we need to speak to our soul and remind ourselves that God is in control. If tonight you're thinking to yourself, you know what, Pastor Sean, there's something in my life that feels out of control. If you, if you look at your own life and you think, Pastor Sean, you know what, um, I haven't really given God control. I have to be honest, Pastor Sean, there are times where I feel like the older brother. I miss the party, I have a bad attitude, I become angry or indignant, I speak badly about other people, I grumble, I'm frustrated, all that. I don't even know how to enjoy when God gives me something. If that's you tonight and you wanna give that over to God, then here's what I'm gonna encourage you to do. I'm gonna encourage you to just take some time to pray with one of these leaders. Pastor Alberto, would you, would you make your way down? I want you to be down here as well. And I just encourage you, Take some time to really process with the Lord tonight. If there's something that you need to give up so that God could be more in control of your life, would you just take a moment as we worship? Come down and get prayed for tonight. Let's take some time to worship the living God. Lead us in, you say. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Take heart in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans for 